Welcome to Bible Answers with Philippians 1-9 Ministries. You're listening to Patrick O'Brien. Today we're going to look at Mark's Gospel in chapter 16, and we'll be going through verses 14 through 20. Now before we begin, I want to make mention that I am not a cessationist, meaning I do not believe that the gifts of the Spirit ceased in the first century of the church or with the apostles. I believe that the gifts of the Spirit are ongoing to the body of Christ as God wills. Now that's a separate subject for another teaching on another day. Today we want to look at what Mark is saying in verses 14 through 20 of chapter 16. Now, when we come to examine any particular passage, especially when we're seeking to make a teaching off of that passage, we need to do something very important. We need to remember that an unclear passage needs to be determined by other clear passages. A particular verse should never be isolated from other verses on a similar subject, and it is always important to make certain that we incorporate everything the Bible teaches on any one subject before making our conclusions. The Bible says, the sum of thy word is truth. So let's begin now in verse 14 of Mark 16. Now, in verse 14, we see Jesus appearing to the eleven apostles, Remember, Matthias, the twelfth apostle, is added in Acts chapter 1, verse 26, by God. We know that from Proverbs 16.33 with the casting of lots prior to the birth of the church in Acts chapter 2 on Pentecost. That was something that happened before the church was born on Pentecost. Now, Mark 16, verse 14, we see Jesus appearing to the eleven apostles. Notice now Jesus speaks in verse 15 to them, which in context is the 11 apostles from verse 14. He says, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Okay, so the command here given by Jesus to the 11 apostles was to preach, which is in the imperative in Greek, not the word go. So often, we see people put the emphasis on the word go. The go is not the command. The go is to preach. So Jesus is speaking to the 11 apostles also in Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. In Matthew 28, verses 19, we see the command, the imperative in the Greek, is to teach, making disciples of Jesus. So what is commonly referred to as the Great Commission to the church, we see the emphasis and the priority is on the preaching and teaching ministry. It is the preaching and teaching ministry that we see being emphasized all throughout the book of Acts. And you can see our Acts study available on our YouTube channel that goes verse by verse through the entire book of Acts. But I want to make that point that you see here in Mark 16 verse 15, The emphasis is on preach. The command is preaching. And then in Matthew 28, verse 19, we see the command of teaching. So we have preaching and teaching. All right. So Jesus also said to the 11 apostles then in Matthew 28, verse 20, that the apostles were to teach the commandments that he, Christ, gave them. These commandments are also again mentioned in Acts chapter 1, verse 2. Between the resurrection and ascension of Jesus, he gave the apostles commandments. This is in a similar way to how God gave Moses the Mosaic law over a 40-day period. Now we see in the new covenant, God, the resurrected Christ, giving his apostles new commandments under the law of Christ in those 40 days prior to his ascension. And you can see more of the mentioning of the law of Christ in Galatians 6, 2, 1 Corinthians 9, verse 21, and also in James 1, verse 24, and James 2, verse 12. So, in the Great Commission, we see Jesus telling the 11 apostles in Matthew 28 and Mark 16, telling the 11 apostles to preach the gospel and to teach the word. Let's emphasize that, to preach the gospel and to teach the word. The apostles would then go on to teach all believers 
these New Testament commandments that Christ gave to them. We do indeed see the apostles teaching the entire church to also teach and preach the gospel. For example, the command to teach is found in 1 Timothy 4 verse 11, Romans 12 verse 7, Galatians 6 verse 6, 2 Timothy chapter 2 verses 1 through 2, Titus chapter 1 verse 9, Titus chapter 2 verse 1, and elsewhere. The command to preach or evangelize is found in 2 Timothy chapter 4 verses 2 and 5, Romans chapter 10 verses 14 through 18, and then Ephesians chapter 4, 11, we see it mentioned. So although the Great Commission to preach the gospel and to make disciples was to the eleven apostles, it was also taught as a command to all believers in the subsequent letters that would become the word of God written to all believers. Jesus makes mention of this in his high priestly prayer, John chapter 17, verse 20. Now moving along, in order to stay on track for this particular teaching, we're going to skip over verse 16. But I encourage you to listen to our teaching on our YouTube channel, Water Baptism versus Spirit Baptism, A Complete Teaching. It has more details on the subject of baptism and expounds specifically on verse 16. Now let's look at verses 17 through 18. This is primarily what most people will try to point to or bring to who are trying to advocate or promote this idea of casting out demons and special deliverance ministries or that speaking in tongues is somehow the evidence that somebody is truly born again of the Spirit. So let's go ahead and look at these two verses. First, we see the author changes from a singular pronoun, he, in verse 16, to a plural pronoun, them or they, in verses 17 through 18. Do you see that? You see the change in the pronouns from verses 16 to verses 17 and 18? This indicates that salvation is not a corporate matter, but to the individual in verse 16. The signs that follow in verses 17 through 18 are to the plural, thus the body of believers. This is not a promise to every single believer. It does not say these signs will follow he who believes. The them that believe here, in context, is still the eleven apostles. The apostles are the ones that did have signs accompany them to authenticate their unique apostleship and authority to teach and write doctrine. And we can see the apostles' doctrine mentioned in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. We can also see these signs following the apostles in various other passages. And let's look at those. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12. He says, The signs of a true apostle were performed among you with all perseverance by signs and wonders and miracles. We also see that these signs and wonders were taking place through the apostles. We see that in Acts chapter 2, verse 12. 43, and we also see it in Acts chapter 5, verse 12. And we'll talk a little bit more about that here in a moment. Now, if someone wants to claim that the speaking of tongues that we see in verse 17 is for all believers, then they must remain honest and also apply the three signs listed in verse 18 to be equally signs or evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But I rest my case. Notice that each of the signs are following the they, not the he. Because remember, these signs are not a promise for every single believer. If they were, they would not be signs. Now moving down a little further, we see in verses 19 through 20, Jesus mentions the them, the pronoun them, still the 11 apostles whom he is speaking to. In the book of Acts, the them that we see the Lord working with and confirming the word with signs that followed were the apostles and their legates, Stephen and Philip. Remember, 2 Corinthians 12, verse 12, Acts 2, verse 43, and Acts 5, verse 12, for starters. Stephen was directly appointed by an apostle approved into ministry. He, like Philip, is what is called an apostolic legate one that is commissioned by an actual apostle. 
There is no such thing in the Bible as apostolic succession. We never see an appointed apostle who is appointed by Christ as an apostle, passing on his apostleship and authority to another apostle. The apostles appointed elders or deacons. That's all we see. We don't see apostles continuing. Now that's a separate subject on something of the nature of the new apostolic reformation and how they believe there are still apostles for today and all of that that cannot be validated nor backed up by scripture no matter what people like C. Peter Wagner want to try to say. The new apostolic reformation is a false teaching. But to stay on subject, what we are looking at here is that there is no command in this passage to do the signs mentioned in verses 17 through 18. There's no command here. There's no imperative in Greek in verses 17 through 18. So Jesus is not commanding believers, even commanding the apostles here, to do any of these things. Okay? He says, specifically then, it, it, it's telling us that there's no commissioning for a ministry with any of these signs. There's no deliverance ministry and no healing ministry. That is not what these passages are saying, teaching, or proving. And nor do we see that in the book of Acts. We do not see the apostles or even the elders of the churches going out and doing deliverance-type ministries or healing-type ministries. What we do see is the teaching and preaching of the Word of God. We see them preaching the gospel, and we see them teaching and expounding the Word of God. Now, Jesus, when praying for the disciples that were present, also prayed by extension for all believers that would believe in Jesus through their word, the apostles' word, which we see written as scripture. You can reference that in John's gospel, chapter 17, verses 14, verse 17, and verse 20. The next thing we need to do is look at the text. The passage does not say these are gifts. It doesn't say that. It says they are signs. They are related yet distinct and with some overlap, but the fact remains that even among the apostles in the book of Acts, these signs were rare and in the minority against the teaching and preaching ministry. Does God still do miracles and healings? Yes, of course, absolutely. If they occur, it will be rare and not for the public display. Signs and wonders do not validate a move of God today. We should understand that the very reason for the signs and miracles were to appoint the apostles as a governing leadership over God's new entity, the church, the body of Christ. If we look at the book of Acts, who was it that took up a serpent? It was Paul, an apostle, and not by choice or willingly. It was spontaneous. Who laid hands on the sick and they recovered? It was the apostles. This was never the normal occurrence for everyone who was a Christian. When Dorcas died, the believers did not raise her, but they sent for Peter to raise her from the dead in Acts chapter 9. Then in Acts chapter 20, when the young man falls from the windowsill to his death, who do we see raising him from the dead? We see an apostle, the apostle Paul, in Acts chapter 20. In fact, these signs are so rare that what is recorded in Scripture, we don't see anything of the nature of, if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. We don't see that. What we do see is the overabundance amount being the preaching and teaching the Word of God. Not going out and speaking in tongues, not going out and casting out demons, not picking up serpents to prove you're a Christian, not drinking poisons, not going into uh, cancer wards and hospitals and healing all the sick. What we see is the preaching. Mark chapter 16, verse 20, And they went forth and preached everywhere. And then it was the Lord working with them, confirming the word with signs following. The signs always follow followed the accurate preaching and teaching of the Word of God. So, with all that said, can we look at Mark 16, verses 17 through 18, and say that there is a ministry for casting out demons? 
or that we as believers need to be going out and casting demons out of people? Can we use that specific text as our quote-unquote proof text? Well, the Word of God does not say that. The Word of God here is not validating a ministry for casting out demons. It's not in the text, which has been made pretty evident and pretty clear at this point. The reason why preaching is emphasized is because the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. It is the gospel that's the power of God. And so that's why preaching and teaching is the overwhelmingly obvious, abundant ministries in the scripture. Not deliverance ministries, not healing ministries. Am I saying that we can't pray for people and then see them healed? No, that's not what I'm saying. We can still see God do miracles today. Am I saying that if somebody gets bit by a deadly serpent who's a believer, but God still wants to use them in this world, and then he could spare their life? Of course, absolutely. But again, these are going to be rare events. They're going to be rare things. The scripture does not show them as things that are uh, proliferating through the body of Christ. It doesn't show them even equal to preaching and teaching of the gospel. They'll be rare events. We also need to be aware of the fact that in Matthew 28, verse 18, when Jesus spoke to the eleven, he says, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. All the authority and power is given to Jesus. Who was it that was confirming the word with signs following? It was the Lord in Mark 16, verse 20. So yes, God can still work through believers, and he often does, to accomplish certain things. But if any group of professing believers is putting an emphasis on a ministry of casting out devils, on the misuse of the gift of tongues, or if they're putting an emphasis on holding snakes in their, their fellowship, or drinking deadly, deadly poisons, which I haven't seen. There are some churches that will grab snakes as a way to validate them being born again. Or if there are churches that are putting emphasis on healing, and, and, and having the faith to be healed kind of ministries, then they are outside the teaching and the doctrine of Christ. There is no doctrine taught in God's word for these to be a ministry in and of themselves. 2 John verse 9 tells us that if you don't remain in the doctrine of Christ and the teaching of Christ, you have not God. It's very important that we stay in the safety parameters given to us by God's word and not go beyond what is written. We should also not be ignorant to the fact that God warns about people claiming to cast out demons and doing miracles as a sign of their Christianity, but who are not saved. Matthew chapter 7 verses 22 through 23. That should be alarming. Just because somebody is claiming to cast out demons or there's some sort of of supernatural thing happening or there's a miracle or some kind of sign. It doesn't mean they're saved or be using by God or being being used by God. Okay, God allows false prophets, Deuteronomy chapter 13. He says that there will be deceivers performing signs and wonders to deceive, to lead people astray. Matthew chapter 24, verse 24. So let's bring this to a conclusion. I want to just give you one more uh, one more truth to sit on. If deliverance ministries were an important ministry to the church of Jesus Christ, then he would have had one of the apostles, one of the writers of the New Testament, dedicate at least some section on deliverance ministries, on casting out devils. He would have dedicated at least a paragraph, at least a few sentences to have the apostles or the writers in the New Testament to teach the church how to do that. How to cast out demons. How to recognize when a demon needs to be casted out. How to go about casting out demons. It's not there. The teaching of casting out demons is not present in the apostles' doctrine, which 
we are supposed to adhere to because the apostles' doctrine is the doctrine of Christ. It is the commandments that Jesus gave to the apostles to teach the church of Jesus Christ. It is not in the scripture. So if we are going to see a miracle of a demon being casted out of an unbeliever, or we're going to see somebody drinking something that could have killed them, but it doesn't, or somebody that should not have been for all medical purposes and scientific reasoning, be healed, get healed. If we're to see that, it's going to be rare. It's not going to be in an overabundant amount as we do see the preaching and teaching of God's word. So I hope that that was helpful because a lot of times when people use Matthew 28 or Mark 16, they'll say, oh, so the Great Commission to, to go out and preach the gospel to, to all the world is not to the church, and but it but is to the church, but this isn't, and they separate and they divide the scripture. And a lot of that comes just because of, of not knowing how to rightly divide the word themselves, or perhaps people w- teaching them or preaching weren't doing the text justice. Okay, just as we've proven, the Great Commission to preach and teach the word of God was given to the 11 apostles alone. And the 11 apostles, thus the apostles of Christ, writing the New Testament, teaching us the commandments of Christ, taught us also to teach and preach. And that's where we get this commission to go out and do these things. There was never a commissioning of deliverance ministry or a healing ministry. The commissioning to the church was to make disciples of Jesus Christ by preaching the gospel and teaching. Not just preaching. It's important that we know evangelism alone is not the great commission it's to evangelize preach the gospel as well as disciple teach them the word of god evangelism and discipleship have to go together they cannot be separated they go together that that is the great commission that was given to the 11 apostles there first and thus taught to the rest of the church by their subsequent letters and their epistles and with that We'll go ahead now and bring this teaching to a close. I encourage you, if you want to know more about Matthew chapter 10 and Luke chapter 10, and if you're well-versed on refuting those who try to make deliverance ministry seem like it's a biblical ministry, then you'll know what Matthew 10 and Luke 10 are all about. And we have a separate teaching that goes into detail about how that was to a specific people for a specific time in a specific area with specific restrictions and had a specific end date. And you can go check out our teaching on that as well, Matthew 10 and Luke 10, because that has to deal with a similar subject. And with that, that's all for today. That's the Bible answer to the question of Mark 16, verses 14 through 20, as best I know how to communicate that to the rest of you. Until next time, we'll talk soon. Press on in Jesus.